Carbon Bus Tours form part of the larger Young Carbon Farms project that we at Sefton and Associates are proud to be managing in partnership with the Future Farmers Network. The project is supported by funding from the Australian Government. What the project aims to do is to build a level of awareness and understanding about climate change, climate variability, emissions and what that means for Australian agriculture and building that awareness and understanding within the minds of the people who are going to be the future of agriculture. To take the next generation of Australia's farmers around one of Australia's most productive farming regions and see the lights come on. It was a real opportunity for us to really make some changes and that's why I'm excited about it. Yeah, just trying to get a few ideas on what we can adapt and do differently. I'm from Ethiopia originally and I was really looking for this kind of opportunities. The Young Carbon Farmers Tour, as we like to call it, the Carbon Bus, really aims to get these young minds out onto the ground and onto farms. I kind of know the science stuff from uni, so I wanted to see the, the practical on the on the on farm kind of application and what's happening in the industry. I hope to learn how to be more regenerative in my practices. I just want to implement the science on the ground. For the betterment of our environment. You know, if we're going to have these extreme climate events and a variable climate to deal with, we've, we've got to make sure we kind of get ready for that and be able to tackle it head on instead of wondering in 50 years what we did wrong. What we also are able to do through these tours is again give them access to leading minds in research. Basically the carbon farming initiative, uh, it allows farmers and land managers to earn carbon credits and achieve other benefits by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and storing carbon in vegetation and soils. You open up the land and there's a lot of talk about it. It's like, is it actually happening? Is this just a thing that government talks about? The main takeaway from this slide and maybe even this presentation is that it actually is happening. There's 155 actual real working CFI projects around Australia. When people talk about climate change, they tend to say, well, it's going to get hotter and it might get drier in a number of areas. Southern Livestock Adaptation 2030, the program was to, to look at putting climate change into farmers' language. Take information looking back in the past, forecasting out to 2030. You get information on climate, you get information on the soil, you get information on the pastures, you get information on livestock, you put it into computer models and then come out with information about what are the what are the various impacts. Increased temperature, reduced rainfall, shorter growing periods in the southern part of Australia. So I'm going to talk about what farmers are actually doing in the Wimmera and the Mallee about the variability in the climate that we're seeing at the moment and how are they managing it. So there's seven main factors that affect on the changing climate. And we know that our mean temperatures are increasing. Crops, it appears that they are maturing at about two weeks faster. Extreme heat events, we can get damage at grain filling, more summer rain and less winter rain. Rainfall intensity is increasing, so you get a lot more runoff. Evaporation is definitely increasing and higher levels of carbon dioxide is making crops grow faster. A lot of the farmers that I'm working with, we are now selecting not only the optimum yield potential, but also when is the frost and the heat risk are likely to occur and what is the risk and the yield loss associated with that. Farmers right around Australia are using this model. What uh, is not talked about quite as much in terms of, of all of this is elevated CO2. In pre-industrial times, the atmospheric concentration was around 280 parts per million. Currently, there are about 400. CO2 is part of the story. As we know, there are interactions with the climate. We know that as CO2 increases, crops become larger. They bring in more carbon, they grow more. That's assuming there aren't other limitations, of course. Plants can become more water use efficient under elevated CO2. They actually lose less water. We've learned that yield responsiveness is highly variable by environment and cultivar probably controlled by water, which is not a big surprise under Australian conditions, but it's important to know how much and where and when those changes occur in order to adapt farming systems. 
Methane emissions from animal production is actually one of the largest inefficiencies in the system. Six to ten percent of the gross energy intake, so the energy in the feed, is actually lost as methane. So that re represents a loss of energy that the animal could potentially be using for production. Methane's got a global warming potential or a carbon equivalence of 21 times a single molecule of carbon dioxide and that makes it the second most important greenhouse gas. Profitable farming with continuous increases in productivity and efficiency is going to help you reduce your emissions intensity as far as grams of methane per litre of milk or kilos of product. A dairy farm is a, a pretty dirty place and you're going to find that out shortly when you go for a walk but it's also quite a dirty place in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. This particular project is one of a whole series of different projects run under the National Agricultural Nitrous Oxide Research Program. It's a coordinated um, program looking at nitrous oxide um, across the, the country, basically reducing end losses by better matching our applications of nitrogen fertiliser and other sources. Demo Dairy is a community owned demonstration and research farm and it's really focused on our ability to graze pasture in situ and minimise our interference. It's learning how to feed enough to optimise production but not go overboard. This is an automatic chamber system for measuring greenhouse gas emissions from pasture in this case. You've got greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide being emitted from pasture. You'll see some have got cow pats there, we've got some with urine on them. We can get a very accurate picture on what gases are being emitted right across the year. One of the issues we've got in an area like this is that we're very highly dependent upon perennial ryegrass. With climate change, can we rely upon perennial ryegrass in 50 years time? There's issues around global greenhouse gas emissions, there's issues around food security globally, and how do we balance all of those together? We know, for example, that the world population is increasing. We talk about nine billion people or next to three billion people by 2050. That's only the point at which the rate of population growth begins to slow. The maximum population is more around 14 billion by 2100. We can't meet the world food security by simply doubling the amount of agricultural land that we have. The United Nations Environment Program predicts that 25% of the world's food production potential might actually be compromised because of environmental issues. If you wanted to reduce your personal carbon footprint right now with the, with the amount of methane produced by livestock, a vegetarian diet will definitely help. There's a number of people in the world that have the privilege that we in this room have of just being able to make the choice. These people in the refugee camp they don't have a choice. They just eat whatever is there. It's these people that have the choice. Automatically you see that, the, that the, the world's wealthier are having less children. So they're a declining demographic. Where does the value lie for Australian agriculture? There's resource limitation challenges in Australian agriculture. There's climate change. Uh, there's issues to do with nutrients. But there's also a very optimistic outlook if we put the investment in uh, because the market for our produce is almost inexhaustible. Farmers are making real change to deal with climate variability, to adapt to that and to also mitigate the effect of emissions on their farms and Jigsaw Farms is an amazing example of that. What we're trying to do today is get you out and show you things but if you get a bit of a snapshot overview of what we're trying to achieve it probably puts it in a bit of context. If nothing else you get out of this today, productivity, carbon sense and conservation can all put together and you'll have a very positive outcome. That's classic Western District, large salinated area going through here, red gum trees, onion grass paddocks. So that's middle 60s, early 90s, about 91, 92. And that's um, after we've had it for about 10 years. And all we've done is actually just broaden the plantations as the fence has collapsed. We've got a lot more biodiversity into those plantations because we put a lot of lower story stuff and it was all local indigenous. How do we design a more climate responsive system? Well, that's why you've got to understand what the challenges are going to be and then you've got to make sure that within the landscape you've got a system which allows you to benefit from these wets, the summer rains for example, but also to make sure that we have a good winter production system in place. So we become grass junkies here basically. I mean people say what do you do and in a nutshell we grow grass. You can say and then we have these four-legged creatures that eat it. Climate variability is real and get more extreme in the future. So to be honest with you is I can see the graduated steps it's those extreme weather events that scare the willy out of me. So we probably need to look at adaptions, not from a farm level, not from a regional level, but probably from a national level. 
on how we're going to assist agriculture because some of them are going to be hit so hard they won't actually be able to adapt. Adaptation should be focused on farmers who want to manage the risk. Mitigation is essential. Local farmer landscape level integration of high input output agriculture and environmental sustainability is essential if we're going to address the critical biodiversity NRM issues on regional basis. So that's where we're at here. I don't know many other systems that are providing income that can get landscape change like we have done with income off the farm. We enlarged this dam, made it in the drought. We thought well, we've got no water, we might as well make the hole better. So we've got eight of these big dams across the place of farms. Evaporation's a really critical issue for us. So we've gone for deeper, smaller water holes. But we've planted, since we've taken over, a bit over 1.1 million trees. And so we've got every subspecies in Australia of maculata in this plantation. And all we know is now what of these subspecies grow well in this area. Maculata are a terrific tree for producing straight saw logs, but there is work in them and they are frost sensitive. You know, if you are going to put them on your farm, you want to know where your frost sensitive spots are and not go there. They'll be harvested on size, depending on market, in 22 to 25 years. And you're looking at even my superannuation basically in front of you, I think. The beauty of this block here on your left, it's probably got some of the best remnant red gums we've ever had. All these plantations are all permanent reveg on your left and on the right, they're agroforestry. You can see there's different species going through some stringies. We've tried to mix it up a little bit at times. So this is 23 hectare plantation. So this was done 11, 12 years ago. Same principle over there, deep rip goes down. We then collect all the local seed and that's done with a direct seeder all the way through. Everyone wants a clean paddock and all of that stuff. It's probably the worst thing you can do from a biodiversity point of view. So the stuff that falls is actually quite significant. Telstra put um, paid grain fleet for this and the way it works is they work on an average car which is producing the equivalent of 4.3 CO2e tonnes per year. And in this environment, they need to plant 17 mixed species, shrubs, trees, etc., to offset. Once we get 236 tonnes sequest on that lifetime, the carbon credits return to us. But you need a system that's got the feed at the right time, the shelter at the right time, genetics at the right time. It's the whole package. I know from a footprint point of view, the quicker you finish that animal, the quicker you're lowering the footprint. The two things that have the biggest impact on your methane per unit of product is managing animal numbers. Mm. So you, you're reducing the number of animals per unit product produced and the weaning, weaning percentages would have the biggest impact. The challenge of climate change is to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. SFS Southern Farming Systems is a grower group. A lot of our research comes from the growers. We assess what they want uh, in terms of research and prioritise it accordingly. There are two projects, both focus on reducing nitrous oxide emissions and improving nitrogen use efficiency. Nitrous oxide is very harmful. It has 310 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. There will be environmental benefits if we can reduce those nitrous oxide emissions, but also economic towards the farmer. SFS came up with two strategies. One was to use a soil probe network, monitoring of soil moisture and temperature, and also to use nitrification inhibitors to attempt to bridge the gap between the waterlogging in winter and the crop response in spring. The key messages here are that nitrogen use efficiency can be improved quite simply and quite effectively by changing just a few small management skills. Thank you. I think everyone's really worked really well together and there's been some fantastic questions over the last few days and it seems like everyone's gained a lot of knowledge. The largest things that I think I could take back is just some more information to help educate other more conventionally minded people in the area. Just to see people that are really motivated and inspired and they're doing it and they're making it work. Managing those things that are avoidable and avoiding those things that are unmanageable. To adapt better to a changing climate, um, you know, grape growers and, and winemakers are really willing to get involved in this kind of stuff. It's been good to meet people, like-minded people that are interested in agriculture. We all bring a really different um, perspective. Coming together to exchange that knowledge, I think, is really powerful. If we can start changing little bits and pieces now, it's going to make a difference in the long run. It's just a question of survival. We've got to feed more people, so why not make the changes to give back to the community. We've seen the figures and the facts. In the not too distant future, it's going to be a problem. We need to all be working together, being less individualist, so that we can better our earth for our future generations and grandkids.